history, and I'm going to talk briefly about human genome evolution. So what drives it? Uh, to my mind, there are about four possibilities, mutation, recombination, selection, and drift. Now, this study is specifically focused at the single nucleotide level only. And in that regard, mutation is AT biased in general, in the sense that um, more mutations create um, AT sites than, CP, than CG sites. And that's primarily due to CPG sites. Where, on the other hand, recombination um, involves gene conversion and is GC biased. Now, uh, all recombination involves some degree of heteroduplex DNA, which if it involves mismatches will preferentially a little bit be uh, repaired in favor of CG more often than not. Selection and drift you know very well. <clears throat> so according to um, you know, neutral theory of molecular evolution, there are three phases of molecular evolution. Mutation, new variants, polymorphism, variants that are in intermediate frequencies, um, perhaps becoming more common, and then substitutions, that is fixed differences between species. So we were inspired to sort of re-examine these fundamentals by the publication of some new data sets for the last few years involving trios. So mother, father, offspring trios um, that were all whole genome sequenced in order to determine empirically the new mutations that occur every generation. So we obtained 210,000 uh, de novo mutations from five different studies, um, studies that were not focused on diseased individuals preferentially. Um, for phase two polymorphism, we obtained 67 million SNPs from the Thousand Genomes Project. These were SNPs um, limited to those that we could, with very high confidence, polarize using an out group. So if it wasn't clear what the ancestral state was, we excluded it. And then finally, substitutions, fixed differences along the human lineage. These were inferred from the ensemble 12 primate alignment. So the first thing that we did was to look specifically at protein coding regions to measure DNDS. So DNDS less than one, of course, indicates uh, predominance of purifying or negative selection. And what we did was uh, compare the ancestral genotype, so in, in, for DNMs, that would have been the parent to the offspring, and then for the SNPs in the subs, we compared the uh, inferred ancestral state to the inferred derived state. And what you notice, of course, you may notice a trend. Um, that DNDS decreases with age of the allele. So on the x-axis, as you go left to right, these are older and older. So new mutations, increasingly old, slash increasingly successful SNPs all the way to fixations. So that's kind of what you'd expect under the neutral theory, that the things um, that, that make it tend to be the things with smaller fitness effect. Put another way, um, the class of these two, synonymous and, and non-synonymous, that have a larger fitness effect, have a smaller probability of fixation. Okay, so what about, uh, what about the rest, the things that actually do make it, the, the things that are, are successful in evolution? Well, the neutral theory sees a polymorphism and as kind of just a continuum along the line from new mutations to polymorphisms to substitutions. So mutations are born as they fix. Is that what we see? Is that specifically what we see if we look at the molecular spectrum of mutations? And by that, I mean the, the uh, six different types of single nucleotide variants. So for example, on, the, on this first cluster, you have C to T mutations, which is equivalent to a G to A mutation, they're the same thing. And what you notice, of course, you may notice two things. The first is that C to T is the most abundant for all three stages of evolution. Um, so mutation being the salmon, and then SNPs in the middle, subs on the right. So you notice that C to T mutations are the most abundant in terms of the spectrum, but you may also notice that T to C increases over the course of evolution. So it's kind of in general what you'd expect under the, under the neutral theory, but what might be causing this slight anomaly? Well, there's been an increasing literature on this phenomenon called GC bias gene conversion. And uh, there, there's been excellent work on this, but what they typically do is group all AT alleles together as weak base pairs and, and group CG together as strong base pairs. So what we wanted to do is, is not lump them together, just look at all six individually. What do we see? Well, the first thing that we notice is that those um, processes or regions of the genome that are associated with high recombination, which you expect to be associated with high uh, gene conversion, um, indeed show the greatest trend in terms of increasing T to C from very rare to very common. So moving right, you're getting a higher derived allele frequency along the x-axis. And then those regions that are not expected to be associated with gene conversion have less of a striking trend. So that's, that's kind of what you'd expect if GC bias gene conversion is driving this signal. 
Um, next, we looked at this measure of heterozygosity or gene diversity, which is essentially um, a, a measure of diversity that depends on minor allele frequency. Now, what you notice, I just want to bring your attention to two things. One is that this is a universal phenomenon across the genome, that T to C has the greatest uh, diversity, but also that at protein coding sites, whether it's a conservative amino acid change or whether it's a radical amino acid change, yes, the overall diversity is depressed, but what you may also notice is that T to C has the highest diversity. So even in the face of purifying selection, it looks like GC bias gene conversion is increasing the diversity of certain SNP types. What might that imply is that GC bias gene conversion can actually promote even deleterious alleles. If you think about it, a typical deleterious selection coefficient might be something like 0.1%, maybe. Um, the bias in GC bias gene conversion may be greater than that, which means even if it's a deleterious allele, it may be behaving as a beneficial one in the course of molecular evolution. That may have implications for uh, mutational mode. Okay, so finally, uh, we wanted to look at SNPs in more detail, and you may or may not notice a slightly conspicuous part of this chart, which is on the right, at the very highest derived allele frequency bin. These are SNPs that are at uh, derived frequencies of 90 to 100 percent. You see a huge TC spike. What could be driving that? And uh, that, that spike is 3% of, of all TC SNPs are in that highest frequency bin. So we thought of at least three explanations. The first is that this could be uh, due to uh, back mutation of derived CPG sites. So if it's a T to C mutation that fixes, it, a certain fraction of them probably created CPG sites, which as we know are hypermutable, so those will back mutate into the highest DAF bin of the SNP spectrum. So that's one possibility. The second is um, GC bias gene conversion, of course, which has the effect of moving the entire spectrum to the right because it's increasing the fixation probability of those variants. And then finally, error. So what, why might that be the case? Why might that create such a big signal? Well, um, and by polarization error, I should say, I just mean misclassification of the ancestral state, which of the two were the ancestor. So this is the um, parsimony dummy or the uh, dummy using parsimony, if you will, it's me. Um, and so what, what we notice, and this is how we polarize these SNPs, is that um, you just look at the outcomes. So if all the outcomes share the same state, this is the scheme we use to polarize, that if bonobo, chimp, and gorilla all shared the T, we considered that to be the most likely ancestral state. Unfortunately, you can get something like this where if the same parallel change happens to create the same derived state in multiple lineages, you would see these Ts here, but, you, but you'd be wrong about the ancestral state of that allele. So polarization error could have a large effect, and what that would do is um, knock SNPs from the lowest frequency bin that are C to T, and put them in the highest frequency bin as the opposite, T to C. So could that be the, uh, the explanation for this phenomenon? In fact, could this be the explanation for all of the signal we think is GC bias gene conversion? Well, um, in order to address that, what we thought is we would do some simulations. And so we use our DNM data, our de novo mutation data, to um, estimate the mutation rates that are context-dependent in the human genome. So for example, in case you don't have X-ray vision, this is what the x-axis looks like. All of the dark blue here are C to T changes, but these rates differ depending on what's, uh, what the neighbor is. So, for example, the first, uh, the, first peak, or the first column is ACA, meaning what's the rate of C changing to T if there's an A before and an A after? You see these types of things a lot in the somatic mutation literature, but we wanted to do the same thing for the de novo mutation, germline mutation literature. Again, you may or may not notice which class of sites has the highest mutation rate. So CPG is through the roof. So yes, that could cause, um, that could preferentially cause the type of polarization error that, that would underlie a false signal of GC bias gene conversion. So what we did um, is uh, we, we use these rates, or we are using these rates, to see what type of spike we might expect under neutrality alone. I looked and unfortunately did not find a simulation a software that could do this on fixed trees. Slim can do it in forward time simulation, these types of context-dependent rates, but um, 
we wanted to have a, have a different approach that could use fixed trees such as those produced by coalescence simulations. Um, so what, what I did was write this program, uh, Trevolver, which has approximately one feature, which is to do this type of simulation on a fixed tree. So you give it a fixed tree, you give it a seed sequence, and then you give it a 64 by 4 grade matrix, just like the one used in SLIM, um, to describe those con this trinucleotide context-dependent grades. And um, it takes about five minutes to do all of history since the gorilla ancestor. Um, if you give it a, a 100,000 base pair segment. So what it does is it spits out a, a DCF file just like that given by the 1,000 Genomes Project. And uh, it also has some other flags, like what was the true most recent common ancestral state of the human sequences, so that we could, we could quantify polarization error. I am sad to say that these, uh, these simulations are not yet finished. Um, <laughs> However, I expect that to be done soon. I hope you look for a bioarchive preprint from us in a few weeks. Uh, it's not looking like polarization error can explain all of that peak by, at any rate, but, um, but we do want to cover all of our bases before we make a proclamation. Speaking of proclamations, um, it, it has been said that uh, the correlation between polymorphism and recombination is sort of a, a proof that in almost every species, in almost every locus, there has been a selected allele nearby. My continued uh, natural selection is daily and hourly scrutinizing every variation in the science, right? Um, so uh, this could be true, but we just want to uh, point out that there are other fitness-independent processes, biases in the mechanism uh, of mutation or combination alone that could account possibly for some of the same uh, associations. And with that, um, I'll thank my mentors and advisors, Dan Brower, Yuxin Foon, Austin Hughes, my PhD advisor, um, who was the best advisor anyone could hope for, Meredith Yeager, Michael Dean, and my other co-authors at NIH, uh, Ming Shui for telling me when my fingers were ugly and I should change them, <laughs> and then Wen Sheng Li and the um, American Museum of Natural History. I have the best postdoc in the world. I'm so happy for the Herstner Foundation and Martine for um, her great meetings and, and helping me to think through some of these issues. So now I'll take any questions. DNA damage in what context? You mean for germline mutations? Uh, just in you know, the separate there's some damage or e break can produce some mismatch here. Yeah. And you're being because the bias for point of C. Okay, but uh, so at the at the germline level or um, uh, or you just being damage can be happening at any time in the Sure, yeah. I I mean I I would think that I'm sort of trusting what the trio studies did here, but they did do some work comparing monozygotic twins. Seeing which, um, you know, which somatic mutations may have occurred post-zygotically, and they they did account for some of that. So I assume that that's not influencing the mutations. I'm sorry, I can't give a better answer. Thanks a lot. <laughs>